want to thank y'all. Looking forward to this conversation as we discuss the role of women in ministry and really want to jump off and, and ask this question. Where do we start? Like, where do we see women in the scriptures and what roles do we see women playing throughout the scriptures? Let's start there. So, you know, I think you can go almost anywhere in any genre and see women playing key roles in, in the kingdom of God. I, I, I think the place you need to start though for you to understand what you're seeing everywhere else is actually in the creation narrative itself where, where you've got Adam and he's got everything you would think you need uh, for flourishing except right. the Lord's blessing. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's God who sees Adam and goes, hey, this is not good. Um, it's not good for him to be alone. And so then he gives him uh, a helper. He gives him Eve so, so that the big plan of God uh, involves uh, a man who, who has a, a mirror, a woman, not, not a servant, not a, but, but a partner in accomplishing what God had intended creation uh, to, to accomplish in regards to it reflecting God's glory by being um, in, in a very real way, um, pictures of his stewarding grace. Yeah. Uh, and so I think once you've got that, uh, then you've got the right lenses on uh, by which you can see the rest of the Bible. I, I think if you start anywhere else, then you start saying things like, well, I mean, yeah, I can see Deborah there, but it was such a dark time in the history of Israel. Yeah. And so that was that. So, so without the lenses of, no, this is God's good, right thing. And it wasn't a good, right thing until Adam had Eve woman, a mirror in which he could see and understand himself. Yeah. Uh, and so I think if you don't start, start there, you, you, you can lose sight of the fact that the man wouldn't even understand himself with, without being able to look into the eyes of a woman, out of me, this is like me. Yeah. Not this is different than me, but this is like me and a gift to me. So that, right? So, so I think that's where we start. Would you highlight anything else? Yeah, I think that the thing that's intriguing about the creation narrative is, well, first of all, that I think when we speak about these things, we're often spending all of our time managing a, a post Genesis three environment yeah. rather than asking ourselves, is there some way we could be moving back toward what things were supposed to have looked like in Eden yeah, and, and what they're gonna look like in the new heavens and the new earth. And um, this whole idea of the woman's contributions when she is created are not just this nice additive to the picture yeah. that what she's going to bring to human flourishing and to the cultural mandate and the, the rule and reign of God going forward Forward. Her contributions are not nice sort of afterthoughts. They are essential and indispensable to the mission. And I think that sometimes in the church, what we have ended up doing is kind of figuring out how, how can we kind of like work that in as an extra thing instead yeah. of understanding that the mission of the church goes forward only through the essential and indispensable contributions of both men and women. Yeah. Okay, so I, I want to stay on this just for a little bit because I do think to your point, Jen, that this is not the starting point for this conversation more often than not. And so if we go back to Genesis, if we go back to the creation account, what's often called the creation mandate or the cultural mandate, right. who is that mandate given to? Given equally to the man and the woman. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that mandate given not just to the man, but to the man and the woman means they are both doing what in that mandate? Just big picture, high level. Ruling and subduing, bringing order out of chaos, uh, all of those things, and the be fruitful and multiply. You know, and, and I think it's significant for us to notice too that all of those pieces that are there in Genesis one are brought back to play when Jesus gives the Great Commission in Matthew twenty-eight. He's saying, "Rule and subdue, be fruitful and multiply, and make more image bearers." And he's not just saying it to men; he's saying it to the church. Yeah. And so we should understand that there's there was a literal understanding of what that meant. You know, obviously when there's one man and one woman in a garden and then there is a spiritual uh, element to that as well that is a picture for the church to emulate. Because well, so you keep seeing it too, right? You see it then again at Pentecost when the yeah. Holy Spirit falls and then you see it again throughout the Pauline epistles where you've got these yeah. pictures of really unique gospel partnerships. I, I think of Priscilla and Aquila. I mean, you, you just have all of these pictures uh, of what we're talking about, all hearkening back uh, to Genesis 1. Mm -hmm. So. so there is the Genesis 1 cultural mandate that is given both to man and woman. You've got the Great Commission given both to men and women, mm -hmm. to the church, that yeah. they are to be involved in this. And yet here we find ourselves around a topic that, man, it's, uh, I, there's division or there's disagreement or sure. there's different camps. And so let's talk a little bit, uh, again, at a high level about some of those differences. So 
Um, why don't you talk about the difference between complementarianism and egalitarian? So that's that's kind of the two big kind of sweeping camps. Yeah. What, what's, what, are the, what are the differences there? So I, I think the only way to have this conversation in the time allotted is to be really broad strokes, which oh, totally yeah. isn't fair, right. but, but I just think if we're, we, we don't have time to kind of nuance it like, like would be most fair to nuance. When, when all said and done, I, I think egalitarians are going to believe on a sliding kind of spectrum uh, that there are no real differences between the man and woman in regards to um, leadership in the home or the church, in regards to um, w whether or not there's male headship or not. They're going to just do away with that and say, no, no, that everything's available to both sexes. Everything is designed for both sexes to operate in that. Complementarianism um, is going to say that, no, 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 the man and the woman are, are created unique in value, dignity, and worth, and yet have been given specific roles by God for the flourishing of human life, both in church and home. Uh, and so, you, again, there's great nuance in both of those. Um, so, so in egalitarian, go, whoa, whoa, actually, and, and I would just totally say yes yeah, and amen. And sure. complementarians would go, well, because I think even especially, so I, the camp that I'm in on complementarians, I mean, I know some that are so far right, they're barely complementarians. They're more right. kind of in that patriarchy place uh, or so far left, they're actually more in that egalitarian place. And I would say the th same thing's true about some egalitarians yeah. I know, that they're in that same space too, where there's other egalitarians that are on the left side of that who would say, oh, actually, you're just a complementarian. And then those on the right who would say to the left, actually, you're more of a Christian feminist. Right. So. Right. so we've said this, there, there's a sliding scale, there's a spectrum in each camp. So in the egalitarian camp, there's a spectrum. In the complementarian camp, there's a spectrum. And so are there other views that would still be in the broad spectrum of orthodoxy that are not in the egalitarian or complementarian camp? Any that we need to address, talk about. I mean, I think there are those who would say that their view is orthodox, but I don't know that we would acknowledge it as such. So like those extremes that Matt just mentioned, right. Christian feminism would say that not just that all roles are available to men or to women, but that men and women are interchangeable, that there's really no, that, that sort of gender is a social construct, all of those kinds of messages. And then on the other side of it, patriarchy says that there's a, something ontological about, about men and women that means that men lead and women submit as a category. So whereas a complementarian view would say there are certain instances where that is true, it is not universally true. All women don't submit to all men. And so I would sure that people in those camps would make an argument for orthodoxy around their views, but I, I would say it's difficult to sustain based on at least my reading of scripture for well, and, sure. And again, just to, I, I always on this want to be as charitable as, as humanly possible. Right. I, I think that I, that I know many of men and women in that kind of patriarchy. And even there, they pay, no, 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 it's even a sliding scale here. Yeah. And then there would be many yeah. in the kind of Christian mm -hmm. feminism world who, who surely would believe most of what you just described, but right. then would say, but, but no, I don't believe that that. So, so it's always important to know that, and, and this is why I love this conversation because right. this is a place for us to exercise a ton of charity sure. towards people who just land differently than, than say th this circle of people would. And almost everybody except maybe one of those categories is gonna argue passionately from scripture that this is what it says. Right. Um, and so I always wanna give just a little bit of grace in regards to the sliding scales in each of these circles, mm -hmm. so. Just to give some appreciation to the nuances, uh, we've, we've been through a process uh, yeah. that we have uh, not changed our beliefs, but refined them yeah. and, and brought clarity to them. Uh, I, I've had people ask, how long did that process take? And at, at, sometimes I say, I think 14 years. <laughs> yeah, and it was then, like 45 yeah. years, I think. And then, uh, <laughs> but the, the most recent iteration of this <laughs> endeavor was probably two years, is that, yeah. does that feel right? Yeah. We were all involved in that uh, along with the, the entire elder board. And uh, Jen, you were part of that team that, uh, that helped write and read and think alongside uh, with the church. And so I wanna talk about what's the village's position yeah. here? Uh, what camp do we land in? You, you've already said it, but I wanna kind of reiterate it and then ask this question, have our beliefs and convictions changed theologically and have they changed in practice? And so Matt, you wanna talk? Yeah, so we, we have always been um, for 15 years. In fact, my, you know, yeah, 15 years. We, we've just said we're complementarians. We're gonna order that way. We're gonna, we're gonna preach that way. We're gonna teach that. We're gonna be unapologetic about that. And we that. still are. We still are. And, we go. and that's where I was going. We're, yeah. we, that has never changed. 
Um, and so when we said men, we, we got working on this. We weren't, we weren't like, it wasn't like culture was bearing its weight and we thought, oh my gosh, change, we're not going to be really reach people. To people don't, yeah. people don't mm-hmm. respond to this message mm-hmm. anymore because that has not been our experience. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but we began to see that our practice of the doctrine right. um, w- was probably out of step um, with what we see in the scriptures. Mm-hmm. And, and so what's, what's hard about that, I think, for people is that in a day and age in which the internet exists, uh, th- there's no space to kind of grow in your understanding and practice of anything. Uh, and so it's, well, you said, you know, in 2004, yeah. and you're like, well, yeah, and, and I was 32, and I read a lot more and prayed a lot more and lived a lot more and understand yeah. the scriptures a lot more. Um, and so, so, so again, it's the philosophy and practice yep. that, that has shifted, not our passionate conviction. And I would say this, not necessarily shifted, but more clearly flowed out of the theological. Yeah, that's, that's, pretty, you know, that's a better way to say that, it. That, that, that link, that theology, philosophy, practice link, um, it was hard to see how this practice over here tied back to this the theological theology. yeah. conviction. Right. And I feel like the work we did was to clarify those connections so that you can kind of move back and forward uh, between those. Um, and I, I've been super encouraged. Oh, oh for question. sure. Feel good yeah. about that, everybody? Oh, feels good. Yeah. Now, I feel like you have to say you feel good about it. I don't feel like a, a group of people here can yeah. be like, we I, feel great about what we let the ladies I mean, do. It, you know, if you had told me 10 years ago that, that this would be what we would come up with, I don't think I would have believed it. Not because I, you know, doubt the sincerity or the, the well-meant intentions of the church. I just couldn't have seen it. And, and, I don't, and I didn't want to think about it, too. Like, I just thought, you know, I've got all of these ministry demands, I would rather think about this than try to figure out where to land on comp. And I know we all kind of felt that way. It's like, we don't really want to talk about this, yeah. but we need to. And and I had seen, you know, increasingly, not just at the village, but elsewhere, that, that um, there were women who were beginning to believe that they had to make a theological trade to, to utilize their gifting in the local church. And I didn't see it as a theological issue clearly, or I wouldn't yeah. still be in a complementarian church. Um, and, and so to be able to articulate a vision for this that is faithful to complementarianism and that um, shows women like that, hey, it's not a theological problem. It was really just kind of a practice thing where we, we needed to think through. A lot of times I think it was like, where, where are we taking a, a, a fear-based approach versus a, a, a love approach? Like where have we, where have we looked for, uh, is there Christian freedom around this? I loved the conversations that we had about Adelphoi about brothers and sisters. Yeah. I felt like now there's an emphasis that I love hearing and hadn't really given a lot of thought to before we started looking into some of this. And so I'm deeply encouraged by the conversations awesome. that we had. I am too. Um, let's let's highlight what some of those changes have been. Mm-hmm. Um, so long process started theological and really ended in terms of practice and, and maybe of maybe you need this maybe you don't need this but i mean it's a 60 page exegetical paper it's a yeah. like it wasn't 79 yeah 79 page exegetical yeah. paper so it there really was heavy lifting <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, done here it wasn't kind of gut intuitive you know let's yeah, where's the wind think, blowing yeah right? mm-hmm. Um, so that's good. Where were you going? Yeah. So just what flowed out of that? Like what, what were you so encouraged about? I guess I should say, what are some of those points that just kind of stand out to you that this changed in light of that? And I'm super encouraged by these changes. I think that, um, until we sat down and did the hard work on it, and I include myself in this entirely, uh, it just hadn't, it hadn't occurred to us to think through like, well, why, why do we put a man in this role and not consider putting a woman in this role? Like, do we have a reason for that? Or does it just feel more natural? Mm-hmm. Is it just sort of the more intuitive thing to do? And, you know, we are, as complementarians, we're always going to have men at the high, highest levels of leadership. But to recognize, oh gosh, there are real implications for that in terms of how we structure meetings and how we have channels of input for women within the body. And so I think one of the most encouraging changes that I saw coming out of it was this notion of a broad application of the concept of it is not good for the man to be alone when it comes to key decision-making moments in the life of the church that we would want to solicit genuine, credible input 
from women in rooms where maybe it wasn't getting in there before, not because we're bad people who don't want the voices of women to be heard. We just hadn't thought about it. Let me jump in on that. And to clarify, and not just when those guys are talking about women's issues. That's right, right. When we're talking about key critical issues, period. Right. We right. need outside perspective. And that was, I think, something that was sort of re revealing to all of us was to begin to think through like, okay, yeah, we need the voices of women as women, but we also just need people who are men and women in rooms yeah. talking about yeah. issues because it's going gonna, it's gonna to change the way that the conversation goes in ways that are healthy for the life of the church. Okay, I want to close with this, with this question. Um, what's at stake here? Um, what's, and, and I may kind of talk through this a little bit myself as I think about what's at stake here. Um, but let's say, let's say a church just, man, doesn't have the energy, uh, doesn't <laughs> have the, the resources or whatever it is. Uh, there is not... Uh, whatever it needs to be present to move them forward, to consider this and to do the hard, heavy lifting. Um, and we just kind of stay with an unclear practice um, around complementarianism, or maybe they're in a totally different camp. What's at stake here for men, women, boys and girls in the life of the church? Well, you know, I, I think you could talk for a long time about this also, but I, I think if I could simplify it, you, you're really looking at uh, either the flourishing of a body of people and the development of young men who understand the dynamics at play um, with, with women as sisters yeah. rather than as either objects or servants. Um, and, and you're looking at the flourishing of women who have been gifted by God uh, for all sorts of different things. Um, not being able to use their gifts in the local body, which then what? Well, it shrinks the effectiveness of the church. It, it, it trains little boys and little girls on, on a real kind of perverse, twisted view of male-female relationships. And, um, and, and so I think the humanity withers yeah. if you don't give some time to thinking about how this is exercised in practice. I think about my own son. Yeah. Uh, and, and I want him... Like I, I want him to serve his sisters and serve his mom and do sacrificial leadership, not because his sisters are weak, but because he, he, he needs to love and serve and lay down his life for something greater than him. But I want my daughters also to love the idea that they don't have to act dumb mm -hmm. theologically in order to win uh, a boy's affection. You know, I, I don't, I want my daughters to flourish theologically. I want my son to, to flourish in regards to understanding what it means to be a man, yep. mm -hmm. uh, which like, it's like, you can't even have that conversation anymore about what it means to be a man or what it means to be a woman. Um, and, and so I think the church has to enter this space where there's so much confusion and, and point back to God's good, right design in, in a way that for, for the majority of people go, that's more beautiful than anything else I've heard. So I'm going to say my piece and then you close it. Um, we had a ton of conversations yeah. around this for a long time. <laughs> yeah. And I can remember one of the conversations being um, uh, about, I've got three, three daughters and yeah. a son. And one was about Lily and, and kind of her being able to look to uh, role models and leaders, mm -hmm. women leaders in the church mm -hmm. that go beyond her time in elementary school. Right. Right. And, um, and that was compelling for me to be able to think about where, where are my daughters seeing vibrant female leadership mm -hmm. in the life of the church that extends beyond their elementary school mm -hmm. uh, leaders. And the thing that sunk in through the study was, was yes for my daughters, but also for Luke. Yeah. Like he's got to see vibrant female leaders mm -hmm. in the church, women leading that he looks to and says, I admire her. Right. There's so much in her that is to be praiseworthy and is to be right and good. Um, and, and if he doesn't, then he grows up as a stunted man. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, mm -hmm. that combination, because that's complementarianism, mm -hmm. that the men and the women, the boys and the girls see this right. and grow in togetherness. And so closing word. Yeah, I mean, that embodiment issue is really important to me. And I can feel it even in my own ministry opportunities. I have too many opportunities. And the reason I have too many opportunities is because we don't currently have enough women yeah. uh, in the church as a whole who are embodying what it means to, and not just a Bible teacher. I mean, I'm probably the most obvious example that people think of when they think of women's gifting that is embodiment. But there are all kinds of ways that women embody ministry in the local church in a way that young girls and young boys need to look to and learn from. And so, you know, my hope through all of this has been, and I think we had part of our conversation about this, is that 
I want to leave the church a more gracious place for yeah. my daughters and my sons with yeah. regard to these issues. I want the church to be a place where they see both what it means to be a man and a woman who is wholeheartedly following the Lord, visibly represented and celebrated and, and also resourced and, and, um, and, and matured. Amen. Yeah. Well, that paper, that long, long paper. Uh, My eye starts twitching yeah, every time yeah. you mention it. <laughs> it's online for anybody who wants to read it. The long one isn't, but there's a shorter yeah. version that's online. Yeah. Uh, just to go back and review anything that somebody may want uh, to look at. But again, as always, thank you guys for the conversation. I appreciate you both.